you were to ask the average fourth grader or fifth grader if George Washington had fought the Revolutionary War for the purposes of freeing the interests of the billionaires and the corporate class in the UK, they would laugh at you. If you were to ask them if Abraham Lincoln fought the Civil War to free the corporations in America, they would go, what? Seriously? Really? You know, it can't, everybody thinks they understood what happened there. However, the U.S. Supreme Court in the last 35 years, more or less, has essentially said these two things. And I want to get to how our history brought us to this point, how we've been through three gilded eras, how we responded to the first two, and we find ourselves now in another one, and how we can most appropriately respond to that. What, back in the late 90s, Louise and I moved to Vermont and uh, bought an old house, and up in the attic found a 20-volume collection of the collected writings of Thomas Jefferson. It's only been printed once. It was pu published in 1909 on the 100th anniversary of the end of his presidency by the Thomas Jefferson Memorial Association. And I just sold a business. I had some time. I was working on a book. In fact, I was going to write a book called What Would Jefferson Do? And so I took about two years, and I read most of these 20 volumes. It was his personal notes, his letters, his diaries, all kinds of stuff. And one of the things that I discovered was that that Revolutionary War that George Washington fought, that we thought was about no taxation without representation, and the Tea Act of 1773, which arguably was the trigger for the thing because it led directly to the Boston Tea Party, that that must have been some kind of tax hike that the colonists didn't like because they didn't want to be paying taxes without being represented. What I discovered in reading Jefferson's letters was that, in fact, the Tea Act of 1773 was the biggest tax cut in the history of the world. The country at that time, and, and the country being an extension of England, was in a Gilded Age. It was in the tail end of a Gilded Age, but it was in a Gilded Age. There was a very small middle class. There were the, the plantation owners and the farmers and the mercantilists in, in North America. There was a fairly large working poor class, and there was this very small class of the very, very, very rich. Virtually all of them were gone by the end of the Civil War, as Jimmy Carter talks about in his new book on, or the Revolutionary War, excuse me, on, the, on, that, on that point. And most of them were in the UK. And the biggest corporation in the world was the East India Company. And they were sitting on a million pounds of tea that they wanted to bring into the United States. And the biggest competition they had was these local tea shops that were all over the country, all up and down the East Coast, that were local entrepreneurial businesses. And they wanted to wipe them out. They wanted to pull a, a total Walmart, put them out of business. These tea shops were buying their tea from local importers who the British called smugglers. And so they gave this giant tax cut to the British East India Company, retroactively, handed them a huge pile of cash so that they could basically dump their tea in the American market and wipe out the entrepreneurs. So the Boston Tea Party was a revolt by the local small business people saying, enough already, enough of the Gilded Age. We are going to fight back. They didn't have a constitution they could amend at that time. They didn't even have a country. But they fought back. We are today now, in essence, in another Gilded Age. Martin Gillens was on my program last week and was talking about this issue. He just, he and uh, Ben Page just completed a study, 21 years. They've looked at, at uh, almost 2,000 individual pieces of legislation at the federal level and another study they'd looked at state legislation. And what they found was that over these last 21 years, legislation that had been proposed and passed was most likely to be passed if people in the 91, 90th percentile income and above, essentially the top 1%, favored it. But if the 50th percentile, the average person favored it, or the 10th percentile, the working poor, favored it, the probability of it being successfully passed was equivalent to noise. It was just, it was random. There was no, you know, it, it, it didn't happen. In fact, he said, majorities of the American public actually have little influence over the policies our government adopts. Instead, the decisions are made, made uh, uh, Gillen said, by, by the very wealthy, by special interest groups, 
and by very large corporations, in many cases not even American-based corporations or American corporations that do business all over the world. They're making the legislation. And this is producing a genuine crisis. This is producing, A, a new Gilded Age. We have wealth inequality like we've never seen before. And B, a genuine crisis in democracy. People are not showing up. The latest study uh, about you know, the upcoming uh, midterm elections indicated that people under 25, fewer than a quarter of them even intend to vote. Why bother? You know, it doesn't matter. People don't, I'm not represented. So how, what do we do about this and how have, how have we confronted this in the past? Well, the last time we had a Gilded Age was back in, after the Civil War, after Reconstruction, during the industrialization of the United States, the 1870s, the 1880s, the 1890s. And as Gilded Ages tend to do, where, where inequality gets massive, then the top just gets super concentrated, it led to a great crash in 1896, and this led to the populist and progressive revolt. And, and you, you found Teddy Roosevelt and then T President Taft, two Republicans, oddly enough, taking on John Rockefeller and the Standard Oil Trust and taking them down, breaking them up into 26 individual pieces and going after the large corporations. They passed the Tillman Act in 1907, which made it a felony. You could actually go to prison if you were an officer or a director of a corporation and you gave money to a candidate for federal office. They, they, they amended, they, they successfully amended the Constitution twice in response to this Gilded Age and, and twice in response to this corruption. Uh, so that senators, instead of being appointed, they were basically being bought at the state level. Instead of being appointed by the states, were directly elected by the people, and that women could vote. And the, the consensus was that women would, would make the, the, the process more transparent and less corrupt. And so that happened. We had the two, these two constitutional amendments, plus a whole variety of other laws that, that made, and in many states, Oregon, for example, um, passed constitutional amendments that allowed the citizens to get around corrupted legislatures with the direct ballot initiative process. They were so emphatic about this at the end of the last Gilded Age. Keep in mind, the first Gilded Age, that ended with the American Revolution. The second Gilded Age ended with the populist progressive revolt and these two constitutional amendments and all these laws. They were so emphatic about it that every, virtually every state in the country passed a variation on the Tillman Act around the turn of the last century. And they were, notice, how incredibly emphatic the state of Wisconsin was about this. This is an old Wisconsin law that Jane Ann Morris found, a historian and author on this stuff. And notice the word any in here. This is, this is fascinating. This is the actual law. No corporation, and it's based on the Tillman Act, and it was legal back then, and in fact, they didn't take it off the books until 1954. No corporation doing business in the state shall pay or contribute or offer consent or agree or pay or to, to pay or contribute directly or indirectly, any money, property, free service of its officers or employees or thing of value to any political party, organization, committee, or individual for any political purpose whatsoever or for the purpose of legislation, uh, influencing legislation of any kind or to promote or defeat the candidacy of any person for the nomination, appointment, or election to any political office. I mean, this is damn emphatic, right? And they put some teeth into this. The penalty to this law said any officer, employee, agent, attorney, or other representative, in other words, lobbyist of the corporation acting for and on behalf of such a corporation shall violate this act, shall be punished upon conviction by imprisonment in the state prison for a period of not less than one or more than five years. If it's a domestic that is based in the state corporation, it may be dissolved. They get the de corporate death penalty. If it's a foreign or non-resident corporation, the right to do business in the state may be declared forfeit. That was how we responded to that Gilded Age. That's how we brought back a middle class in America, in part. I mean, there's a lot of other pieces to it. And, and it worked, right? It worked. The American Revolution ended that Gilded Age. This ended that Gilded Age. Now we have this new modern crisis. And this Gilded Age is a little more difficult to take on because the Supreme Court has said, essentially, that Abraham Lincoln did, in fact, fight the Civil War to free the slaves. There were three constitutional amendments after the end of the Civil War, the 13th, 14th, and 15th. 13th says uh, you can't be a slave anymore. 14th says regardless of your, you know, no matter what, you, everybody has the equal right, uh, equal protection under the law. And the 15th says that former slaves can vote. 
But according to Justice John Paul Stevens, who recently left the court, this judge-made law, which has come into place in the last 35 years, more or less, and really emphatically in the last decade, that really when the founders wrote the First Amendment, they weren't just talking about speech. They actually meant to protect money, that money is somehow magically found in the First Amendment. And, and when they wrote the 14th Amendment after the Civil War, they actually meant to protect the corporations when they were talking about persons who had equal, right, equal protection rights. In a way, this started with the Buckley versus Vallejo decision. And, and in that case, they, they began dealing with the issue of the constitutionality of speech, of money as speech. And although they, at that point, they were calling giving money to political campaigns the regulation of conduct. It was still regulatable. A year later, in First National Bank versus Bilotti, it really started to fall apart. And by Citizens United and McCutcheon, campaign contributions had fully become speech and corporations had fully become persons, First Amendment, 14th Amendment. In part, this was because Lewis Powell in 1971 was horrified in the late 60s. He was a tobacco lawyer in Virginia, and he saw the tobacco industry was coming under, under fire. But he saw other industries coming under fire as well. And in the 1960s, and he named specifically in this memo he wrote in 1971, he gave it to his, his friend Eugene Sindor, who was the head of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, which up until that point had been entirely um, apolitical. He said, uh, Rachel Carlson's book, Silent Spring, and Ralph Nader, he called out Ralph Nader by name, his book, Unsafe at Any Speed, these books had ignited a consumer movement in the late 60s. And this was a threat to corporate America. And he said, we have to get politically active. We have to get institutionally active. We have to take over the schools. We have to take over the legislatures. We have to take over the judiciary. We have to create think tanks and create public opinion. Business has to get its message out. It's not enough for the US Chamber or any other business organization to just be a business organization anymore. We've got to get out there and be active. And, in, and you know, the US Chamber read this memo. This was early 71 and said, Pfft. Okay. And out of this have come a whole variety of major institutions that have shaped public policy throughout the United States over the last 40 years in very significant ways, leading right to these dual Supreme Court doctrines, in many cases explicitly to these doctrines, that money is protected by the First Amendment, even though you don't find the word money in the First Amendment. And the corporations are protected by the 14th Amendment, even though you don't find that in the 14th Amendment. So what do we do about this? I mean, he was put on the Supreme Court three months after he wrote this memo by Richard Nixon. And once he got on the Supreme Court, he started arguing for these positions. And in the Buckley case in 76, and in the Bilotti case in 75, excuse me, and the Bilotti case in 76, in Boston versus Bilotti, the Supreme, you know, up until that point, Massachusetts had a law that said corporations can't put money into political events. First National Bank was, uh, of Boston was throwing money into a political event that had nothing to do with banking. Frank Bellotti, the Attorney General, came in, tried to shut him down. They took this to the Supreme Court, and Powell and his buddies said, oh yeah, they've got, they've got a right to free speech. It's a corporation. William Rehnquist wrote the dissent. He said, this is crazy, amazingly enough. So now we have this judge-made law. No legislator in any state in the United States has ever voted to say corporations are people and money is speech. Never. No governor has ever signed such legislation. No legislator in the United States House of Representatives or Congress in the history of the country has ever suggested such a thing. No president has ever signed it. In fact, go back and read the 1887 Grover Cleveland's uh, annual address to the nation, his State of the Union address, in which he talks about the iron heel, the iron boot, the iron heel of corporations being upon the necks of average citizens. This was back when, the, right at, it was the year after the first time that corporations as persons was argued before the Supreme Court. So what do we do about this? Well, there is a very clear suggestion to fix this judge-made law. It's the 28th Amendment, the next amendment to the Constitution. It's been introduced into Congress by Richard Nolan, and Congressman Rich Nolan, uh, Richard Nolan and Mark Pocan, among others. And it says a few things. These, this is, it's, it's very short, very brief. Basically, the rights protected by the Constitution of the United States are rights of natural persons only, right? We the people, not we the corporations. <laughs> Artificial entities, corporations, shall have no rights under the Constitution. They have privileges, of course, but no rights under the Constitution and are subject to regulation by we the people through federal, state, or local law, number one. So no more corporate personhood. 
Number two, no more of the Supreme Court saying that money is speech. The judiciary, this is the Supreme Court, shall not construe the spending of money to influence elections to be speech under the First Amendment. Very simple. This is, this is how we get around it. Now, the objection that I hear from people to this is, wait a minute. There are 27 amendments to the Constitution. It, there have been over 29,000 proposed since 17, uh, 1793 when it was first ratified. And, you know, good luck. Well, the reality is, at the end of the last Gilded Age, we got a couple really fast and they were very successful because the people's dander were up. People were upset. People, people understood the problem and they pushed it through. We had a similar situation in the United States, a similar crisis. It wasn't a crisis of a Gilded Age, but it was a similar crisis back in 1971. You had young people going off to Vietnam and dying, and they weren't old enough to vote. They were old enough to be drafted, but not to vote. Barry Maguire's song, The Eve of Destruction, you're old enough to vote, but not for die, uh, not, old enough to die, but not for voting, hit the number one billboard, and, and America was animated. And so the, the uh, 26th Amendment was proposed. It, went, it was uh, proposed into Congress in March of 1971. It was ratified on July 1st, 1973. From the time it got dropped into Congress, Congress has to pass it, then three quarters of the states have to ratify it. It took three months and eight days. It is possible to amend the Constitution. This is, this is the one that lowered the voting age from 21 down to 18. It is possible to get a constitutional amendment when we, the people, say, hey, enough. We've had enough already. Which means that the job now, if we want to end this Gilded Age, and we want to put the power of the, uh, of the United States government back to the people, so that people actually want to vote, because they're actually represented, if we want to do it, we have to wake up America. We have to tell people what has happened. We have to tell people what can be done. And this is, there's many other possible solutions. I think this is the cleanest and most powerful. And we have to be waking up everybody we know. Tag, you're it. Thank you.